Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, our PUSD students, staff, families, and community. Welcome to our second youth town hall this year. My name is Ria Apodaca. I'm the director of PUSD Health Programs. I'm really proud to be here with all of you and with our panelists as well. Tonight's event is a collaboration among PUSD employees from Health Programs, Mental Health, Thrive, and Communications, and valuable community partners from Huntington Health and Exeter Urgent Care. We also are joined by a PUSD alumni on our panel, and we're very grateful for him to join us as well. Tonight, we're going to present and discuss topics related to mental health, anxiety, depression, and ways to get help if someone is struggling. Tonight, you might hear something that causes you to feel differently or that makes you feel uncomfortable. And if that happens, please know that it is normal to feel unsettled or off sometimes. And if that happens, we want you to do what you need to do to feel okay again. So if that means you need to stand up, walk around, do a breathing exercise that you may have known that already helps you out, please do it. Give yourself the space that you need. Now I'd like to introduce you to one of our special guests who will serve as our moderator of tonight's Youth Town Hall, Dr. Talin Kalagian. Good evening. I'm Talene Kalabian. I'm an emergency medicine physician in Huntington Hospital. I'm also the assistant site medical director at Extra Urgent Care in Pasadena and La Cunada. We're honored to be here. We want to thank Glenn Pasadena Unified, sorry, for offering us this broad platform to connect with you today. We have a very informative and dynamic discussion uh, planned on anxiety and depression in the adolescent community. This is the result of the collaboration between Huntington Health which is an affiliate of Cedar sinai uh, an esteemed psychiatric uh, pediatrician, Huntington Health Pediatrics, Huntington Emergency Medical Group, Extra Urgent Care, and Pasadena Unified School District. On our panel tonight, we have Dr. Spacia McHale, who's an emergency medicine physician, as well as site medical director at Extra Urgent Care of Pasadena, as well as La Cunada. We have Dr. Paul Kirkchin, who's board certified psychiatrist in adults, as well as pediatric psychiatry. He has affiliations with Huntington Hospital, Verdugo Hospital, um, Los Encinas Adolescent IOP, and Wellness at Occidental College. Dr. John Rodarte, pediatrician at Descanso Pediatrics with Huntington Health Physicians, and medical director of the Pasadena Unified School District. We also have Erica Vialpando, as well as Lara Chulakian, both managers of mental health services at PUSD. Our panel will start with an informative presentation followed by a question and answer session. If you're part of our live audience, please write down your questions. If you are attending this uh, online, uh, you may leave your question in the chat box. We're going to try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Our hope today is that this discussion helps families recognize the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety. We hope to destigmatize these very common conditions and facil facilitate conversations. We hope to give you information about accessing varied number of resources within the school system and the community so no one feels alone, fearful, or helpless when confronted with these feelings and situations. On that note, I'd like to pass the mic on to Dr. McHale. Good evening. My name is Aspasia McHale, and as mentioned, I'm an emergency medicine doctor uh, working at Huntington Hospital, and I'm also the site medical director at the Extra Urgent Cares in Pasadena, La Cunada. Tonight, we'll be discussing a very important topic that may be affecting each of us to some degree, and we'll be focusing mainly on anxiety and depression. Most likely, all of us here have experienced some form of anxiety or depression at some point in our lives. In fact, over the last two to three years, since the COVID pandemic, the number of people dealing with anxiety and depression has significantly increased. In fact, and, and as a parent of two young adults and as an emergency medicine doctor, I've experienced firsthand 
how issues with mental health can take a toll on the person suffering and the loved ones around them. So tonight, let's have an open and honest discussion about anxiety and depression. So the goals, of, the goals we hope to accomplish in this discussion are understanding what anxiety and depression is and what it looks like, learning about the treatment options for both, and knowing how and where to get help. So what is mental health? It's our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It determines how we deal with stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. And I'm not just talking about food. I'm talking about making right decisions in life. So mental health conditions can affect people of all ages and all races. No one is immune. And today, we'll be focusing on anxiety and depression. The two most common mental health issues that people of your age are suffering from. I do want to point out that it's normal to feel some kind of anxiety or depression, and when it, but when it interferes with your daily functions and activities, then it might be time to get some help. So who is at risk? Anxiety and depression affects more people than you think, and we are all at risk. In fact, one out of three of your peers is suffering from anxiety to some degree. Not everybody requires treatment, though. Anxiety is also the most common mental health issue in children and adolescents. In regards to depression, the number of adolescents with depression doubled from 2009 to 2019. And since 2019, during and after the COVID pandemic, the number of people suffering from depression and has risen significantly. So why do we get anxiety and depression? The causes fall into three categories, biological, psychological, and social. And we're going to first talk about the biological factors, and these include our genetics and family history. Genes are our DNA. It's what makes us who we are. And our genes are passed down from our parents, which were passed down from their parents. So if your parents have a history of anxiety and depression, you have a higher likelihood of, of possibly developing it too. Then there are certain medical conditions. So if your thyroid isn't working properly um, and then your thyroid hormones are low, this could contribute to your feeling depressed. Finally, there are substances that can contribute biologically. Certain medications can make us feel anxious. For example, if you're prescribed steroids or an, an asthma inhaler, um, it can make you feel jittery and mimic the, the signs of anxiety. And when we refer to medications, we're not just talking about prescription medications. We're also talking about over-the-counter medications and herbal preparations as well. And then there are other substances like vape and alcohol, marijuana, or other recreational drugs that can also affect our mood and either make us feel anxious or depressed. Then there are psychological factors. These include traumas or losses. An example, of a, uh, an example of this would be if you've ever been involved in a major motor vehicle accident or um, have lost a loved one. And then there's abuse and abandonment. Having suffered from any verbal or physical abuse or feeling like you've been left all alone or forgotten by a parent, a loved one, or guardian. Then there, there are our family interactions and the environment we live in. So how we interact with each other at home has a huge impact on our mental health. There are certain forms of communication between family members that may seem benign, but may actually be harmful. So being too critical. When we are too critical, it may sound like we're, more, we're negative more than constar constructive. And ultimately, one is made to feel like they failed or didn't live up to certain expectations. Being sarcastic. Sometimes family members use sarcasm to be funny, and sometimes things said in jest could be misunderstood, and sarcasm could lead to one feeling belittled or ridiculed. The other is unintentional distancing from others. So although we may not realize the negative impact, when we distance ourselves from others at home, so everyone is sitting in their own room, doing their own thing, and they're not communicating or interacting with each other, this could lead to a sense of isolation. So while being too critical, sarcastic, 
or distant are not the only interactions of concern. These are three of the bigger ones we wanted to highlight. Finally, there are social factors. These include our school and peer interactions. Dealing with the stress of school, all the after school activities, sports, college applications, or even dealing with peer pressure and school bullies. Then there's housing and finances. The worry of making sure there's enough money for rent, food, bills, and clothing. And finally, the community we live in and, and the a fear of school violence. This is about what's going on in our neighborhood and in our schools. For example, we may be living in a neighborhood where gangs and drugs are prevalent, or we may also be worried about violence at school and the possibility of a mass school shooting. And lastly, probably one of the more relative social factors that you are all dealing with today is social media. This is one of the biggest stressors affecting our young people today. And in fact, researchers have found that the most frequent problem associated with increased social media use is, guess what, anxiety and depression. Don't get me wrong, we, many of us use social media to keep in touch with friends, stay up to date with current events. So you might be thinking, so what's so bad about social media? Well, here are some of the issues. One of them is the issue with popularity, checking to see how many likes or dislikes we got, how many followers we gained or how many we lost. It creates an unhealthy need for constant validation. Then there's the constant comparison to others, which could sometimes lead us to feeling like we've fallen short or feeling like we've missed out. One example includes body image issues. Am I thin enough? Am I pretty enough? Then there's also cyberbullying, getting harassed, threatened, embarrassed, or even targeted by others on social media. It can also lead to sleep, depri uh, sleep deprivation because you stay up at night scrolling through social media channels and before you know it, two or three hours have gone by and you've missed out on really good sleep. And it can, can also contribute to a lack of physical activity. When you're sitting idle on your phone or your electronic devices, it keeps you from engaging in physical activity. So while the desire to be popular, the constant comparison to others, cyberbullying, sleep deprivation, and the lack of physical activity aren't the only negative factors associated with social media. These are some of the bigger uh, issues we wanted to bring to light. Now, keep in mind, despite everything we've just mentioned, the good news is that there is help. No matter what barriers you face or how tough things are, there are people and resources you can turn to for help. We'll go over in detail who to turn to for help a little later in this, in this discussion. But before we dive into any more details, I want to pause for our special guest speaker uh, who's here with us today. We want to welcome with us today Christian Dimayuga. Uh, we are, he is a, a recent graduate of PUSD's Center for Independent Studies, and he's currently a sophomore at the Pasadena City College. We are honored to have him with us today and we commend him for being present today to share with us his personal experience with anxiety and depression. It takes a tremendous amount of courage to share one's story, and we are grateful to him for his contribution and his support. Welcome, Christian. Um, thank you for that great introduction and very informative um, information about mental health. Um, yeah, so I was invited here today basically to talk about my mental health journey. Um, basically, it begins, I would say, in fourth grade. I was dealing with a lot of uh, emotional issues, and um, I was also an only child, so my mom basically had the foresight to put me in, in therapy early at, at a young age. And we also have family history of mental illness, so I think my mom was able to see those signs in me early on. Um, so that was good on her part. And basically I, I was in um, therapy all throughout middle school and then in high, or ninth grade I entered Marshall. Um, I graduated from CIS but I started at Marshall. And um, I was dealing with a lot of, um, you know, going through puberty and just dealing with a lot of um, 
personal issues, and I was also, even though I, I was doing really well academically, I was um, overwhelming myself with a bunch of APs and just all those extracurriculars I'm sure the students in here can relate to. And um, I just wasn't getting better and became more suicidal as time got on. And that's um, also when I started seeing a psychiatrist and was prescribed medication. Um, but um, like end of ninth grade, I had uh, basically uh, a depressive episode. It was really bad and I ended up getting hospitalized and uh, 5150 it ended up you know going to the urgent care that I'm sure they'll talk about um, but uh, yeah I was hospitalized and um, that was kind of I think an eye-opener for my mom and just my support system in general and like people from my school they saw that I wasn't really getting better so they um, at that point um, my medical health insurance took over and basically uh, put me in like what's they're called like short-term RTCs or like residential treatment centers um, so I was put in a couple of those um, f during my sophomore year um, and uh, even though I was in those I was um, not really getting that much better because I was still getting hospitalized um, well in between ninth grade and before I went to the the tr RTCs I was still getting hospitalized and yeah, I just wasn't getting better. And that's what ended up me being put, or that's what um, was the cause for me being put in these short-term RTCs. And um, basically, I was stable, but I um, just wasn't, I was dealing with a lot of, um, like, I was feeling unmotivated a lot of the time. And um, I didn't want to go back to school when I came back from those uh, treatment centers. And so at that point, my IEP team at the district, so here, they took over and they were, you know, exploring different options for me. Um, and they really um, did a lot to support me and, and tried all these different options. Um, I was, uh, you know, did like homeschool where a teacher came and did that for a little bit, but it didn't really help. And then they uh, put me in what are called like non-private or non-public uh, schools. They're just like different schools that are catered towards um, you know special education or um, students with mental health issues and I was um, tried those but I didn't really like them and so eventually um, as a last resort they my IP team was like um, we're gonna send you to Utah basically I got sent to um, a long-term RTC or um, they're also known as like therapeutic boarding schools and I was there for a year from 2018 to 20 or late 2019 and so when I came back, um, I had finished most of my schooling, and but I still had a semester left. And so um, during that time, I came back like early 2020, and then as we know, the pandemic happened. And so that kind of put a pause to everything and what um, me finishing school, and I just became really agoraphobic, so I, I didn't leave the house. Um, oh, also I should mention, I like I cold turkey my medication, so I, I stopped taking medication, which I don't recommend, but I became very depressed and um, started becoming really anxious and, and just falling into those old habits again and um, it wasn't good for me and but thankfully my IP team was really supportive of me during that time they were still checking in on me and my uh, therapist um, from basically my IP Stephanie Weiland who's here today um, she was still trying to call me and check in with me even though I, I didn't respond and eventually I started to respond and, and started seeing her more regularly, but um, it took quite a while. It took like maybe like a year and a half before, um, between when I came back from Utah and before I started seeing um, Stephanie regularly and started being active participant in my IEP. Um, and during that time, I um, started, I actually enrolled in PCC before I even finished from, finished my high school diploma um, because I was like, I just want to get it over with. And, you know, I was, I was kind of, I, I do really enjoy school. I just, um, I have, you know, it, mental health issues and it was really hard for me um, just to, you know, get that motivation, which I think a lot of students struggle with, but I really didn't want to go to school. So, you know, I enrolled myself in PCC without, um, and so I was doing PCC and, and I was still um, working on my high school diploma at the same time. And then eventually, in uh, I finished my high school diploma at CIS, um, and they've also been really supportive of you know everything. Um, I have to shout out Gareth, Mr. Gareth Siegel at CIS, who really um, 
like I wouldn't respond to him, but he would he would talk like during the time where I wasn't talking to anybody, he would like call like almost you know like twice a week, and he would just like call my mom like checking in and, and just seeing how I was doing, and it was really you know it it really is those um, those special people in your life that you know those advocates in your life who really make a difference. I would say you know especially you know here at PUSD, it, it's those teachers, it's those counselors, it's those therapists, it's those you know psychiatrists who really really do make a big difference and, and you know make make you feel like you're not just a dot in a in an ocean but you know there are people out there who really care for you um, so that was really helpful for me um, but yeah I finished uh, from I f oh yeah I finished my diploma and then I uh, oh last year and then yeah so basically I did really well with um, at PCC. So, like last uh, spring, I applied for a um, an undergraduate research fellowship at Caltech, and then I got that. And then I stayed at Caltech last summer um, on campus and was basically participating in research there. And then I'm still there working as like a uh, in, while I do my studies at PCC, I do part-time research at Caltech, and then um, I'm planning to transfer to UC Davis in a year. So, um, yeah, I would say I, I made a lot of improvements for myself in the last couple of years, um, but that wouldn't have been possible without all the supportive, um, all the support, or wouldn't have been possible without the support system I've had, um, especially my, my mother, who is here with me today also, who's really been a strong advocate um, for me and, and just really never gave up. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, like I said, it's just me and my mom. I'm an only child, and I was my. It's my mom raised me by herself, so um, she really has been an advocate for me. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be here without her today. So I, I thank everyone who has supported um, me. And I guess one thing I would advise, like other students here in the room that are going through the same thing, is just like I know it's cliche, but really just don't give up. Like <laughs> um, there, there are people out there who who will care for you, and there are. Um, you know, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. I always say, like, even though now it may seem like really dark and you may seem like you're never going to get out of it, like, you, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and, and there are people out there who are willing to give you a chance, willing to support you and, yeah, just don't give up. And, yeah, that's pretty much it, I'd say. Thank you. Just this up here. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Kirk Chen, and I'm going to be talking about the three most common. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Christian for uh, it, it takes a lot of courage to come up and share your personal story. So let's give another round of applause for Christian. So, you know, oftentimes to uh, to address the issues in the shadow, we have to open the curtains and let the light in. So the more light you shine on a shadow, if some of you know about Carl Jung, uh, we can decrease and shrink these shadows that things people never talk about. So uh, I think uh, it's important for Christian to share these experiences with the public to normalize these type of things so that we could all start having conversations about them. Uh, and I'm happy to participate in this and help kind of demystify what is mental illness. So I'll jump right into what is uh, anxiety. So there are three uh, most common forms of anxiety that we see in the adolescent age group are generalized anxiety disorder. The second one is panic disorder. And the third one is social anxiety. And it's important to know what form of anxiety someone is suffering from since the treatment may differ for each. Some symptoms might even overlap. Slide 13. So what is generalized anxiety disorder and what might it look like? So, are you feeling restless, wound up, or on edge? Do you feel tired easily? 
Are you having a hard time focusing, maybe? Do things irritate you easily? Do you get unexplained headaches, muscle aches, stomach aches, or other unexplained pain? Do you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? So having trouble controlling your worries and fears for six months, plus answering yes to any of these uh, questions might mean that you could have generalized anxiety disorder. Next slide. So what is panic disorder and how might this look like? So panic disorder is when you have unprovoked anxiety attacks that escalate very quickly in a matter of seconds to a feeling of impending sense of doom. Uh, these episodes last around five minutes. You might get pounding or racing heart, sweating, trembling, uh, chest pain, uh, feelings of impending doom, fear of losing or being out of control. And these are often with no trigger. And the next type of anxiety we have is social anxiety disorder. This is, the definition of this is when you have fear and avoidance of social situations and interacting with others. So you're isolating because of this fear and it's not out of choice. Sometimes it could lead to blushing, sweating, trembling, pounding or racing heart, uh, stomach aches, rigid body posture or speaking with an overtly soft tone. Uh, or having difficulty making eye contact with people uh, and feeling self-conscious or fearful that people are judging you negatively. Next slide. So the other major topic is what is depression? So the, the most common form of depression in people of your age is major depressive disorder. Uh, so I'm going to just go through all of the symptoms of major depressive. The first one is decreased interest or pleasure in all activities. So that might not, uh, or significant weight loss or weight gain. Sleep disturbance. Can't sleep or you're sleeping too much. Fatigue or loss of energy. Inability to focus or concentrate. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. Irritability, agitation, or aggression. Finally, recurrent thoughts of death. So we're going to then talk about what are the treatments for these conditions. So there are two forms of treatment options. The first one is medication. Uh, the second one is therapy. The, the type of therapy we're going to talk about today is mostly cognitive behavior therapy. We call it CBT. Uh, so just because someone needs therapy, it doesn't mean that they've made a mistake. So mental health problems, they're the same as having a medical illness, and it's only going to get better with treatment. It's not going to go away if you ignore it. Uh, and it's important to realize that medication and therapy is not for life. This is a very common question that parents ask me as a psychiatrist, is my child going to have to be on these medications for life? And oftentimes, medication can be tapered off after six months of consistent improvement. And you and your doctor could form a treatment plan together to decide if you would like to continue medication or not. So in conjunction to treatment of any kind, it's also recommended that you get evaluated by a private doctor to rule out a medical cause for your uh, possible mental health condition. And with that, I'm going to hand off uh, the lecture to Erica and Lara. Good evening. I'm Lara Chalakian. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the manager of Thrive School Mental Health here at PUSD. And so let's talk about therapy. What is therapy and what happens during therapy? So it's a confidential space. You're going to be meeting with your therapist one-to-one -one on a weekly basis. It's talk therapy. It's aimed at treating mental health issues. It's a place to explore and identify ways to change your troubling thoughts, feelings, and actions. It's a place where you learn to work out your problems and to learn some coping skills. 
At the very beginning, your therapist is gonna ask you some questions about what's bothering you or causing you stress. They're gonna ask about your life, your friendships, family, academics, and so on. And then you and your therapist will identify goals to work towards. And then the treatment begins. It could be short-term, meaning just a few weeks, or it could be long-term, a few months, maybe a year. There are different forms of therapy. We have a few listed here, and this is just a few, but there's play therapy, there's art therapy, and then like Dr. K mentioned, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, which my colleague Erica is gonna go into now. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Erica Villalpando, a licensed clinical social worker and manager for our PUSD Mental Health Services Program. And um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview and hopefully a good introduction to what cognitive behavioral therapy is. Um, so what is cognitive behavioral therapy? As mentioned previously, it's commonly called CBT. So we'll say CBT from this moment on. Um, so again, it's one of the most common and preferred modalities of talk therapy because it's been shown to be effective for a wide range of problems such as um, depression, anxiety, peer relational issues, low motivation, uh, school related struggles and other stressful situations. Um, it's also helpful, oh, I already said that. Um, so CBT can be used with people of all ages, including children, teens, and adults. Um, I'd also like to share that talk therapy and CBT can be providing, provided using activities. So like Laura mentioned, there's art therapy, play therapy, right? So we can uh, provide CBT through those activities as well. So the therapist will adjust the interventions and the techniques based on the age of you, the client, the person seeking help. So um, you will not be bored, you'll have fun and hopefully enjoy the time. Um, so the goal is for you to be engaged in therapy and in uh, receiving CBT, not bored and feel better. Um, uh, we use different activities to engage you in CBT. Um, so if you take, oh, can we leave the other screen, the other, yeah. Okay, there you go, it's okay. So if you take a look at the graphic with those cute little brains, right, you'll see the cognitive behavioral therapy triangle. So the triangle is at the center of CBT and it focuses on the idea that your thoughts influence your feelings that influence your behavior, okay? Um, so when we use the CBT triangle, we work on identifying unhelpful thoughts and unhealthy. So unhelp unhelpful and unhealthy thoughts. And we work on changing those thoughts to more helpful or more healthy thoughts. Um, so once we do that, we also explore how those unhelpful thoughts are influencing your behaviors and your feelings. Um, so here's one example. So uh, here's one example of an unhelpful thought that you might have. No one likes me, I have no friends. So we would work on changing that unhelpful behavior, uh, I'm sorry, unhelpful thought, to something like, I don't have as many friends as I would like at school, right? So we'd work on that. So if the thought is more helpful to you, then this would hopefully influence how you feel in a positive way and increase your motivation to attend more school events, for example, or to, um, to join a sport or a club and then the results could be that you would make more friends at school. Um, and then next slide, now I'm ready for the next slide, thank you. Um, so here are some important points uh, to emphasize about how cognitive behavioral therapy can help you. Um, so it can help you gain awareness of unhelpful thoughts, like I mentioned in the example. You can learn strategies to problem solve. You can also gain a better understanding of your behaviors and those of others, but mainly yours. Um, and you'll learn coping skills to manage difficult situations. And lastly, I'd like to point out one of my favorite interventions in using CBT is you'll learn how to calm your mind and calm your body, which is really important. Um, so thank you. And with that, Dr. Rodarte will continue to talk about where to get help. Thank you. As mentioned, uh, I'm Dr. John Rodarte, and I'm not only the medical director for Pasadena Unified School District, uh, but I've been a practicing general pediatrician in the local area for over 22 years now. Uh, but what may resonate even more with all of you out here and, and uh, watching on live is that I'm also a father of two teenage students in Pasadena Unified School District. So I get it both at home and in the office, right? 
uh, I can certainly say that as a community pediatrician, uh, we've always dealt with teenage mental health issues. Uh, but since the pandemic several years ago, and in combination, uh, as mentioned earlier, with things like social media, and not just social media in terms of like your, you know, your Instagram and things like that, but uh, just texting and direct messaging and things like that, the instant stuff that comes up, uh, we've definitely seen a sharp increase in teenage anxiety and depression. As such, we as general pediatricians, we're often kind of called the uh, first line of defense uh, when it comes to diagnosing and managing these issues especially if you have a regular pediatrician uh, that's seen you over time and really has gotten to know you, uh, that really helps in having that relationship established already and to be able to talk about these issues when you come in to see your doctor. Oftentimes I will get uh, parents bringing their kids in complaining of chronic headaches, stomach aches, just tired all the time or refusing to go to school. And while there can be medical reasons for a lot of these issues, they often are really a symptom of either anxiety or depression. And it's our job as pediatricians to help recognize that and to direct you as a patient or a parent to the right resources. Uh, so if you have a primary care physician, I encourage you to start there if you're concerned about mental health issues. Uh, we're also fortunate that PUSD has some great resources and we'll be touching on that in a moment as well. Uh, I often sometimes have families who during a crisis will take their child to the local emergency room or urgent care. And that can be appropriate if the concern is more for a, met, a physical medical condition. Uh, but there, these places really aren't equipped or suited for mental health treatment, unless it's escalated such to the point that maybe that person requires a 72-hour a psychiatric hold, known as a 5150. There are, however, some uh, urgent cares that are more tailored to this, uh, such as behavioral health urgent care centers. There's two uh, located in the City of Industry in Long Beach. And these have 24-7 mental health care services for emergencies. Uh, the Alhambra Behavioral Health Center is another place as well. Uh, there's another local resource called the Insight Clinic with a site in Pasadena that our very own Dr. Kirchin will be uh, helping patients there as well. They provide an intensive outpatient mental health services and a very kind of holistic approach. Uh, but if you're looking for an appointment with either a therapist or a psychiatrist and you don't know where to go, like I said, often, one, you can start with your pediatrician. You could call, if you have insurance, you could call your insurance carrier and ask them for uh, local offices nearby that might be covered for you. Uh, there's also a website called ZocDoc.com, Z-O-C-D-O-C.com. We'll put that up later. It's an online resource that can help match you with local provider, uh, either in person or virtually. Uh, they can base it on your insurance, or even if you're uninsured, you can use that as a resource as well. Uh, so those are some different ways you can kind of get plugged in. The first thing, though, is take the initiative. Get plugged in. You've got to get the help. Don't be afraid to ask. So ask your pediatrician. Uh, ask the school. Uh, ask any of these resources we're giving you. In fact, I'm going to pass it on to Laura now to talk more about the PUSD services that are out there. Thank you, Dr. Rojarte. Okay, so let's talk about where do you find mental health here at PUSD. We have a plethora of options for you. We've listed seven of them, but I'm gonna, Erica and I are actually gonna cover, there you are. <laughs> We're both gonna cover the top three on here. So there's PUSD Mental Health Services, there's Thrive School Mental Health, and then there's school-based mental health agencies. And we're gonna focus on these because they are available to you at your school sites. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, I'm the manager for our PUSD Mental Health Services program. And so we provide one of our two internal mental health services programs at PUSD. So we provide individual therapy, medication support, case management, family therapy, behavioral rehabilitation services. And we serve students at all sites, but we're primarily based at certain sites based on um, whether students have Medi-Cal or maybe their students under our um, special education um, counseling program and also students under one of our grants who may have been exposed to pervasive violence in the Homer community. And uh, Christian actually got services from our program, so really proud of that um, and happy he was here. So, and that's, there's my contact information if you need that. Thank you. Okay, so we have Thrive School Mental Health. I'm the manager of this program. Um, so there are two internal mental health agencies, Erica's program and my program. So we, uh, my team is also internal. We provide, I have an amazing group of clinical social workers, licensed clinical social workers, and master of social work interns. And they all provide individual and group therapy counseling at your school sites. They provide social emotional support. If there is a crisis on your campus, they tend to these crises. 
Um, sometimes just a brief support is needed, brief intervention is needed. So they're there to provide that brief intervention. They also provide parent and staff psychoeducation, and then they'll link you to services that are outside, you know, the, in the community, outside of the school district. Um, our team services students with private insurance or no insurance, but at no cost to the student or family. And we are at most, at most PUSC school sites. My contact information is there if you have, ever have any questions. And then we have school-based mental health agencies. So there are six of them that are listed on here. The district contracts with these six community-based agencies, all six of them provide services on school campuses. And so each of them has about a handful of school sites that they directly service, and they service students primarily with Medi-Cal. So for example, um, let's take for example, if you are a student at Pasadena High School and you have Medi-Cal, the agency that services your school site is Sycamores. So you can reach out to your counselor at school, you can reach out directly to Sycamores, um, you can reach out to your administration. They all know how to give you uh, or how to connect you to these services. They have referral forms, they have contact information, so that is one avenue. However, if you want, you can directly call Sycamores yourself. Um, all the contact information is on our uh, PUSC website. So you can find every single agency, every single school site that they um, service, and their contact information. Oh, that's you. All right, it's still me. Well, when in doubt, <laughs> contact us. Um, please contact us. We're here to help you. I know this can be confusing. We both know this can be super confusing. If you don't know what the agency is on your school site or you just need extra help finding services, please contact either Erica's department or my department. Either one of us will, will respond to you or we may have one of our team members call you and provide you with um, the, the different options. So our contact information is here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And here are some hotlines and, and resources for you. So the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which is 988, right? We have the Trevor Project Crisis Tech text line that's really great for teenagers. You can text and it's really easy. Um, you just text 741741 and you type in home and you can start uh, contacting somebody. And as Dr. Rodarte mentioned, those are the urgent healthcare centers. And then again, your local hospital is really helpful as well in emergency situations, Huntington Hospital. Yeah, and um, with that, that concludes our panel uh, presentation, and we're going to move into the question and answers um, section of this. So, thank you so much. Thank you for all the to all the panelists. Thank you. Okay, our first question is: How do I tell my parents and my teacher how I feel? Um, so first off, I would say, so something we work on in therapy is assertiveness skills, right? So verbal assertion, being able to express your thoughts and feelings. So one of the main things to consider is um, saying it in a way that is not going to maybe um, insult somebody. So just plainly stating, I feel this way or or I think this, whatever the case may be. So being assertive is really helpful. It's not, it doesn't mean that you're going in there and that you're demanding anything. It's just be saying that you're able to express your thoughts and feelings. Um, one of the, what, something to, that we work on is when you want to talk to somebody about maybe a really serious conversation, you can say, hey, do you have some time to talk? You know, at this time, as opposed to maybe they're busy, maybe not, they're not um, able to respond to you in the way that they would like to. So setting it up and giving them some time to have time with you um, and saying, can we talk after class? Can we talk after school? Whatever the case is so that everybody is very settled and present and be really present and mindful. Maybe do some breathing exercises before um, and have a message, a message uh, that comes with kindness for both of you. So. Thank you. Dr. Rodarte, Dr. Kirchin, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think assertiveness is a great skill, for example, that this is a concrete thing that you could learn in therapy. And if you come from a family such as my family, I, my last name is Kirkchen, so I'm, I'm, I'm Armenian. I went to Longfellow, actually, so I'm a former Pasadena Unified student. But, uh, you know, in some communities, mental illness is very stigmatized. 
where you, you might be afraid to tell your parents because they might feel that there's something wrong with you or that, oh, that's bad, you shouldn't feel like that, why do you feel like that? So sometimes it's helpful to talk with a therapy, and therapy is confidential. You don't need to get you know, permission to see a counselor at your school. And sometimes when you talk to a counselor, they could kind of help you figure out the words to uh, use to describe how you're feeling with your emotions. And they could help you navigate that conversation with your parents. Um, you know, so it's, it's a higher kind of threshold when you're talking about medication. For medication, you do need your parents' consent. And as a child psychiatrist, that's what I do. So I'm, I went to medical school and I went to residency and fellowship. I went to UCLA and Cedars. So my, my job is more to help patients and families de decide if medication is right for them or explain options to them. So if, if that's something you're interested in, that's a conversation I have to have with a parent. But just to get started in therapy, sometimes you could see your school counselor to kind of help you, give you the vo vocabulary. Because oftentimes when I first see kids, they can't even describe their emotions. So the, the, it's kind of like learning a new language in a way. So you have to develop the vocabulary to put the words to your feelings. And sometimes that's not easy. It takes some time. And a therapist can kind of help teach you the, the kind of correct vocabulary to use. Yeah, I'll add one thing from the other side of the spectrum. If, if you're the parent that uh, your child is coming to, don't freak out. That's the first thing, OK? <laughs> don't freak out. Be thankful that your child has come to you with that kind of issues. Uh, try to remain calm and say, OK, let's work on this. How can we help you? you know, you're, as a parent, all we care about is helping our kids, right? So try to remain calm and say, OK, let's figure out what's the best way to get you the help that you need. But remaining calm is, is key, right? It's taken a lot for your child to come to you to admit this to you if you're not aware of it, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, so be thankful, and then let's help them through it. Thank you. I want to mention that these are questions that have been submitted, and we're continuing to get questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, I think the next one is probably going to be for our social workers. I want to go to the school counselor and tell her how I am feeling, but I don't want my teacher to know that she is making me anxious. What should I do? <laughs> So like Dr. Kirchen mentioned, a lot of this is confidential, especially at your age level, 12 and over. So if you do go and confide in your counselor at school, they're not going to be telling your teacher. But that is something that you're going to be working on in your therapy sessions, you know, how to appropriately, effectively work with your teacher, work through any issues you might be having, how to, you know, effectively handle that. But your, your counselor is not going to be sharing this information with anybody. So this stuff is confidential. Thank you. Next question. Um, I think this is for the whole panel also. Can depression lead to drugs? OK, I guess so. <laughs> so it's important. Well, drugs, I mean, psych drugs or street drugs. <laughs> so I'm assuming we're talking about substance abuse. So sometimes people can self-medicate uh, there's a term called self-medication when you have either anxiety or depression and you use a substance to kind of make yourself feel better. And that could become a, an unhealthy pattern sometimes. So it's not uncommon to see people use drugs as a way to mask their depression or not have to process it or not think about it or just kind of numb out the feelings that they're feeling. So in that sense, yes, it, it can lead to substance abuse. OK, next question. Thank you for that. I like my clubs, and I like, did you have something to add? Oh, sorry, I didn't see. I was just, I was just going to add and say that um, it's actually common when we first start working with students, if there is a student who might be using drugs as a form of coping or numbing, like Dr. explained. Um, but, but once we start working together and start therapy, um, there is improvement and students, young people, individuals will then seek other healthy coping skills. So just because maybe that's something that's happen happening once you get help, 
will, you know, feel better and choose healthier coping skills. And we see that actually often. So I just want to say that it is possible to get to, to um, get help and stop using drugs if that's something that you want to do. So thank you. Thank you, Erica. Anyone else? Any additions? Thank you. Next question. I like my clubs and I like my sports team, but I have no time to do my homework. I don't want to give them up because they make me happy, but I get anxious when I don't finish my homework. This is for the whole panel, parents, Christian. <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest, like, you, po you probably need to drop them. Um, I was also in, I was like in marching band, I had a zero period, and I was like in theater also, and I was in mock trial, along with taking two AP classes, and this was in my freshman year and I just I couldn't handle it like it just you know it broke me so to that person I would recommend like at least drop one I would probably maybe drop the clubs and, and maybe you know do sports or or you can you know talk with um, your teachers or you know whoever or the people who run those programs you know maybe you can come up with some sort of plan to get your homework done but also do those things that you enjoy but um, I will say, like, you, your homework is your priority, and um, that is most important for, you know, if you want to go to college. But, you know, it depends on your situation. But, yeah, I would say, you know, your mental health is most important. Um, it should be your priority, and, you know, everything else should come second. But, yeah. Any additional comments? Quick addition to that, life is a balance. You have to learn how to balance your own life. And what's this is a great time to start learning, how do I balance with all these responsibilities in my life? And how do I prioritize my responsibilities? And what's most important? And what is my ultimate goal in life? And how, how are these activities gonna help me reach those? Or, I mean, some of these do make you happy. So you do wanna keep some of those activities that make you happy. But also if they're causing anxiety, maybe in therapy, this is something you can work on. Organizational skills, time management skills. So these are all things you can work on with your therapist. So that led me to think about, you know, what if your, your inability to kind of balance your life could be due to something like ADHD? This is a very common condition. And it, it's due to, uh, it, you know, it, it's due to a dysfunction in your front, frontal lobe of your brain that's responsible for executive functioning. So that means planning things, you know, getting a schedule together. Uh, you know, so if, if you do have something like ADHD, it could be very difficult to balance all of these things. So uh, it's also important to get, you know, screened for that or diagnosed for that if maybe that's the question that's coming up. Thank you for that. Great thought. Next question is, and we touched upon this, but um, I think some uh, expanding on the initial que uh, comment would be great. How does a parent's depression affect their child? <laughs> so a lot of studies have shown that, uh, you know, sometimes maternal depression uh, can have adverse consequences on, on children. And, uh, you know, a lot of families, especially after COVID, a lot of people lost a lot of loved ones. And there are still families that are going through grief and loss and processing this. And uh, sometimes those parents want to hide their own feelings and emotions from their kids to protect them, but the kids could often feel that and they could internalize these emotions. So uh, it, you know, it's, it's important to, you know, the, the individual, when you're getting therapy, sometimes it's not just individual therapy. You could then branch out to do family therapy because you could learn all the best coping skills in therapy and go home to a dysfunctional home where there's chaos and there's arguments and fighting. So it's, it's important that the, the family dynamics are addressed in, in, in therapy as well. It's, it's not just you learning coping skills, but uh, learning, uh, like Erica was saying, learning assertiveness, learning how to tell your mom or your dad, you know, I don't like the way we communicate. I, I would like for 
things to be different. Mom, what do you think about maybe coming to therapy with me or doing family therapy? So it's, it's, uh, it's very important. Like the individual doesn't exist. We all are, uh, you know, in, we are who we are in the context of our relationships with each other. So I think it's, it's important to have a broader dialogue to bring people into uh, family therapy sometimes. So uh, I hope that answers that question. It does. There is a second part to that, though. What do I do if my parents' depression worries me? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one because we, we look to our parents to give us the answers <laughs> and to guide us. And when, when we're, we're worried about our parents, we can often feel helpless. You know, it's, it's that, and helplessness is a big feeling of, you know, depression and, and some, so it's important to realize that uh, your environment that you're in, it could kind of perpetuate your, your symptoms. So uh, we were talking about what are the causes of depression. Sometimes maybe you, you have no genetic predisposition to be depressed or anxious, but you're in a home where there's, uh, you know, you're, you're in fear of being evicted or there's financial stressors or you're, one of your parents got sick or fired. And so these, all of these environmental things can make you feel helpless, make you feel like you can't control anything. It could, it could lead to these negative maladaptive thoughts that we were talking about. Well, uh, I can't really change my future. I can't change my circumstance. I might as well just give up. So sometimes a, a really negative environment could, could cause these symptoms of depression or feelings of hopelessness. And so, you know, that would be a good time to seek out help in therapy to kind of help you uh, kind of put things into perspective and maybe help your parent get into therapy uh, themselves. So uh, a lot of this is learning how to ask for help. It's very difficult. A lot of people sometimes feel like they don't want to ask for help, that maybe it makes them feel weak or something like that, but I think uh, it, it's very important to, to practice these habits and to learn how to ask for help and recognize when someone needs help. So it, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It takes a, a practice and you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta learn the right words to kind of uh, seek the help that you are, you're looking for. And, and that takes practice, you know, you, with, just like with lifting weights or something, you're not going to lift 100 pound weights overnight. You start with five pounds, then you go to 10 pounds, and you go 15. So it's kind of, it's a gradual process where you learn a little by little how to advocate for yourself and how to uh, ask for help. And then eventually you get the right help that you need, but you got to practice those skills. Thank you. Um, one thing to be cautious of is to have the tables turn. You know, you as, as the child do not want to become the caretaker of the parent. A lot of times us, you know, if you have an issue going on, that's a natural tendency. I want to help my mom. I want to help my dad. I want to be there for them. And that's great, but you shouldn't be the caretaker of your parent. You know, so that's where if you're going through therapy as, as a child, that's a great opportunity to say, hey, you know what? This is really helping me. Maybe it's something that would be helpful for you too. You have to be careful. You don't want to say, you need to go to therapy. Because <laughs> what would happen if your parent told you that? You wouldn't like that either, right? So... It's maybe saying things like, you know, this has been really helpful to me to help with my feelings. Maybe it's something you would be benefit for you as well, you know. But be cautious, like I said, of becoming the caretaker of your own parent. That's not your role, and that's an added stress for you as a child. Okay. Thank you. It's a great point. Um, what are some good apps for anxiety and depression? That's a really great question. So there is the Calm app. There is one we were just talking about, um, Silver Cloud. There is another one called Oak Meditation and Breathing app. All these apps give you different avenues of coping. They, they teach you how to do deep breathing. They help you in, in, in various different ways. So there's definitely apps out there. Um, we can, we don't have them listed here, but I could repeat those. Calm app, Oak Meditation and Breathing app, Silver Cloud, these are some ones that we recommend. Okay. 
Next question, how do I know if my friend is depressed? I, well, remember some of the signs that we had on one of our slides, right? So um, are they seeming sad more days than not? Are they, do they have really low motivation for things? Are they isolating? That's a really big one, right? When you're young, when you're a teenager, you typically want to hang out with friends. Um, and so if they're isolating and kind of withdrawing, that could be a sign. Um, also, maybe the drugs, we just talked about that. So maybe using drugs could be a sign. Um, not doing well in school could be could be a possibility. Um, not engaging in activities that maybe you invite them to as well could be one. Um, maybe instead of coming to school, they're sleeping all day, right? That could be something. Um, so a lot of those signs that we talked about. So look for some of that there. And you know, if you're concerned about them, you can ask them, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Checking in on them is a really great idea as well. So I don't know if anybody has. Yeah, especially for me, that last point, don't be afraid to ask. If it's your friend, you know, and you, you know this person, you're like, something seems off to me, ask them. Maybe they've been waiting for somebody to ask them. You know, you're not doing well. Say, so, hey, you know what? Dude, man, you're acting kind of different. I just want to see everything okay, you know? Anything going on? And that gives them an open door to talk to you and to talk to somebody. That might be what they're searching for, what they're waiting for. So, you know, don't feel like you have to just watch and diagnose it. Go ahead and ask them. They're your friend. Talk to them. Coming back to the symptoms of depression, everyone feels depressed or sad sometimes. You know, it's a normal feeling. We don't want to pathologize everything. But we're talking about when it becomes a disorder. When it becomes a disorder is when it affects your activities of daily living and it affects your functioning. So a lot of the signs of functioning are grades or different things like that. But as a psychiatrist, they always taught us uh, there's this term called anhedonia. And this is the cardinal symptom of depression, meaning you cannot have depression without having this symptom. So anhedonia means losing interest in pleasurable activities that you used to like to do before. So that's a good one to ask your, if you see someone that used to love a certain hobby or doing a certain thing and then they've all of a sudden lost interest, nothing makes them happy, that's kind of different than normal sadness. So sometimes that's, that's kind of a good uh, kind of red flag to make you think maybe this is more than just normal feelings of sadness. Thank you for that. Um, this was touched upon actually by uh, Erica as well as Dr. Kirkjian. Next question is, I have a hard time waking up for school. What should I do? So my question would be, what are you doing at night too? What is your sleep routine? And then um, are you staying up? We were talking about being on your phone. Um, you know, is that what's hindering you? Or are you having racing thoughts and you're not able to sleep? There's so many reasons why, but it's really the routine at night that really impacts your not being able to wake up. It's not the only reason, but that is definitely impacting your ability. Um, but also is, oh, I just lost my thought. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, what was I gonna say? Oh, and just in general, adolescents, you need a lot more sleep. So um, you definitely need your sleep. Adolescents tend to sleep in even more in the mornings. And this is kind of why I think we changed our uh, bell schedules as well, to give you a little bit more time in the mornings to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so the next one's very timely. Do energy drinks make anxiety worse? <laughs> uh, Short is it can, yes, you know, so a lot of them have are very high, highly caffeinated and what's caffeine do? It makes your heart race, right? And that can kind of mimic a panic attack, an anxiety attack. So having that feeling all the time, if you're already having those symptoms, can really make it worse. And then what happens to these energy drinks? You're up late, you're keeping you up because I gotta do my homework, right? So I'm drinking tons of energy drinks. Well, now you're not sleeping. Now we get back to the last question. Why can't I wake up for school in the morning? Because I've been staying up late doing all these energy drinks. And then again, that can, the poor sleep pattern, that can worsen the symptoms of anxiety, depression as well. So yeah, doing, you know, once here or there, probably not a big deal. But if you're downing these regularly, really not good for, especially someone with, dealing with those kind of issues. Thank you. We're going to come to our last question. How can I reduce stress and anxiety when it is time for tests and finals?
start. Um, so one of the best things that helps me is in anything that I need to do, but what can help you is preparing for it, right? So when is the test? How many days do I have to study for it? So preparing um, as opposed to just completely forgetting about it, and then the test is tomorrow morning and you don't have time. So taking the time to plan your studying is really helpful. Um, uh, that can decrease stress. Um, taking some time to, we talked about with CBT, you can learn to calm your body. So learning some techniques to calm your body and reduce um, some of that anxiety could be breathing techniques. Just having, going back to sleep, some kind of sleep routine, right, could be really helpful. Sometimes when we work with clients, sometimes I say, let's think about you as a baby, a warm bath, kind of winding down, your lighting is low, and get enough sleep. So definitely preparing, I think, is one of the main things for getting ready for tests. Um, and part of that preparing is making sure that you're doing the studying when you need to and your homework when you need to and asking for help when you need help. So some practical things. Uh, so the big one of the big things that came to my mind with tests is that uh, you know, it takes a lot of glucose to power your brain. So it's really important the morning before you have a big test to have a very, not a fatty breakfast, you know, because then you'll have like, you'll fall asleep during the test. But uh, it, when I was taking my MCATs, I remember in med school, I had a routine where I would go to sleep at the same time every night just to make sure my sleep was good. And I would have a big breakfast in the morning just to kind of power my brain. So sometimes we're so busy that we forget to eat. So uh, it's really important to also remember to uh, not forget your nutrition because you know it, your, your brain uses more glucose than any other organ in your body. So it's, it's important to, to remember to eat before a big test. That's one of my little piece of advice. <laughs> Yeah, I think those of us that are the three uh, MDs going through med school, we, we would kind of echo that we had to do a lot of studying and a lot of sometimes late night studying. And ideally, you study way ahead of time, and that doesn't always happen in real life, right? Sometimes you cram at the very end. Uh, so inevitably, it will happen. So how do you get rid of that stress part of it? Um, like I said, if you, hopefully you've done some studying ahead of time, but when you're doing that, make sure you set aside like, okay, I'm going to do it real hard for an hour, and then I'm going to take a five-minute break. Give yourself mental breaks. Get up. Get off the couch or bed or you're sitting on or your table and chair. Um, you know, for me, I used to actually have a dart dart board in my room and I would play five minutes of darts, just mindless playing darts, something like that. Nowadays, it's probably like a game on your phone, right? Uh, but uh, again, in terms of your phone, have that aside when you're studying because it's too distracting. It's really, unless you're having to look stuff up on your phone, you know. But if it's distracting, that's your that's your five minute relaxation time. Okay, now I get five minutes on the phone. I can answer all those texts. I can you know uh, look up a game, do whatever it might be, and that might be your break. Uh, but take those mental breaks. It's hard to try to push you know for five hours and be up until 1 a.m. and you know studying. And what are you going to retain? You got to give yourself a mental break. Eat appropriately. You still got to get enough sleep. Otherwise, you do all this studying, then you're going to fall asleep during the exam. So it's setting yourself up for doing well. Ideally, study ahead of time. That doesn't happen. Take the breaks too. So I do want to add um, positive self-talk and self-affirmations. So that kind of looks like, you know, I can do this. I got this. I've studied hard. I'm going to give it all that I have. I, I, I'm, I'm capable. So giving yourself the positive, you know, little pep talk before the test. You can start the night before and right before the test. That's really going to help. And this is something we work on in therapy too to identify the positives and to, to change your negative thinking to the more positive. So we work on self-affirmations and positive self-talk. Yeah, I just, I wanted to add to what everyone else is saying. Um, accommodations, I mean, if you have a 504 plan or IEP, those accommodations, they can definitely add on like, uh, or that can add on to your, um, to support you like extra time or, you know, taking uh, an exam or test on your own. Um, and the good news is um, as a college, current college student, you can still have those accommodations. So like even now, I just, I just had finals last week actually, and I'm able to get uh, accommodations where I can take uh, an exam on my own and have extra time. And you know, the, the, your professors are, um, they're always willing to accommodate you wherever you go. Cause you know, it's the law basically. I think there's like the, the disabled student, I don't know, but um, they have to per um, 
a lot to help you, and um, that's been really helpful for, uh, helpful for me. But yeah, I do personally. I do have ADHD, so I do have a hard time studying. Um, like even um, even though I know I have to study early, like um, and take their advice what they said, I still have a hard time studying early. Um, so what I found helpful for me is just um, yes to also take breaks, but um, just to go with your natural um, flow of when you're motivated and when you're not. Like for me personally, uh, I feel really motivated at night. Um, I'm just like a night owl, so um, I don't really study in the morning um, and I don't really do much homework in the morning either. But I will um, be up late studying and, and uh, doing homework because that's just, that's just the natural rhythm. Um, but thankfully my classes start late. They're like, they're always, I schedule them always afternoon because I can't like function, before, I can't do like 8 a.m. or anything like that. Um, but that's a good thing when you go to college, you can schedule, make your own schedule um, and you know, there are accommodations for you and yeah. So before we close, I would like to thank our panelists for coming for your time this evening. I want to especially recognize Christian again for sharing his story. And I also want to recognize his mom who's in the audience. I, I don't know her, but thank you very much. And uh, finally, thank all of you for coming in the house and being here and being a part of this conversation. Um, your physical presence is a part of it, and also any of you who have submitted questions, really appreciate it. And thank you to all of those who um, participated online. Uh, this is um, uh, something that we can refer to later at a different time as well and come back to it. And just remember all of the, all of the um, key points, the jewels that you heard tonight, that there is help, there's a variety of resources, and we are here for any conversation that you'd like to have at the end of this town hall too. So thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>